What's up, everyone? In this episode of Motive Tech presented by Spares Box, it's our tuning guide for the GR Yaris and GR Corolla three-cylinder turbo engine and drivetrain. Our regular viewers will know that we purchased our GR Yaris back in February 21 and had 12 months of pretty hardcore development from not long after the car was first released. Now it has been a whole lot of fun developing a new platform because obviously when we got it, there basically was no aftermarket parts and it was a whole lot of fun being at the forefront of development with the GR Yaris. We had a whole bunch of great battles trying to set the quickest lap time at Wakefield in the GR Yaris, back when we were concentrating on handling, but then when the power bug hit, well, we went tit for tat with E Canoe uh, for the quickest GR Yaris in the world down the quarter mile. Well, the first in the 11s, and we ended up with a 10.8 second pass. Super impressive for a car that essentially still had a standard engine except for valve springs and camshafts. Even more impressive were the power figures. When we went past 450 horsepower, the internet was pretty abuzz with that before we ended up at 511 horsepower. So we've learnt a lot in that 12 months, and before the car gets raffled off by LMCT, we thought we'd share with you everything we've learnt in that 12 month period. going to talk about the basics and the summary of what you need to do into certain power levels which I've broken down into stock ECU, stock turbo and upgraded turbo and then we're going to talk to Ryan from Powertune for you guys that want to have even more in-depth detail about how to tune a GR Yaris and GR Corolla engine. Now before we start talking about power levels and modifications there is one thing I want to clear up about the GR Yaris and that is how inconsistent its four wheel drive and factory ECU are on the dyno. Now we think the reason for this is because it has different diff ratios front and rear when it goes onto a chassis dyno it can actually overheat the four wheel drive system go into front wheel drive mode and spike the power levels. We've actually seen that happen with our car. And this is basically the reason why you want to dyno the car in front wheel drive mode. You can simply put the handbrake on slightly and for extra security disconnect the plugs out of the rear differential. The other thing is, is how inconsistent the factory ECU is. We have seen variations of up to 30 horsepower on a dyno when the car is standard with the factory ECU. We've seen artificial rev limiters come in when dynoing in fifth gear. We've seen weird uh, pulling of timing and power up top in fourth gear. We tried third gear to get more consistent. We tried everything, but the factory ECU is just all over the shot. And the reason I want to mention this is because there are so many manufacturers out there giving claims about how much power their intakes or exhausts make for the GR Yaris. But here's the thing, if the car's so inconsistent on the dyno, how can you give an accurate reading about how much more power your intake makes? Uh, and I found that even when conditions were exactly the same, exact same intake air temp, exact same ambient temp, tire temperature the same, we would still have different power readings for reasons that we don't know. So now I'm not going to accuse any manufacturers of obviously fudging their claims, but it is easy to see that potentially some parts being sold in the GR Yaris market, they are simply cherry picking the worst run when it's stock and the best run after it's modified and making it look like it has extra power. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's take a look at the modifications we did to the GR Yaris because, hey, we know what worked for ourselves. Now, I hate using the word stage when it comes to tuning, uh, so I've broken it down into stock ECU, stock turbo, and then aftermarket turbo as I guess the area of tuning. Now, if you have a stock ECU, the big question is, do you bother with modifications? Well, like I said before, with intakes, I think there's very minimal power to be had by putting an aftermarket intake on and our experience was there was zero gain in performance at all from an aftermarket intake with a stock ECU. So for us, yeah, it's a cross for intake. What about the exhaust? Well, we did find with a catback exhaust that on the dyno we didn't really seem to get any power difference. We did actually have a slightly quicker car at the racetrack. Is there five horsepower difference in a catback? Maybe. Um, do you get a better sound? 
Definitely. When we went to the full exhaust system, we did notice that we probably had approximately 8 to 12 horsepower difference with an exhaust system on the car with the stock ECU. Some people have said they haven't felt any difference. Some say they've had a couple of mile out at the track. But overall, we think full exhaust gets the tick. What about an intercooler? Well, we found that changing the intercooler, even with an aftermarket ECU, there was no increased power to be had with an aftermarket intercooler, but there was more consistent intake air temp. So I guess if you're circuit racing the car, you would use an intercooler, but for your average modifier, I think at this level, intercooler is a no. Uh, what about a chip or an interceptor? Well, I find this really interesting. We actually did test a couple of interceptor style chips on the GR Yaris because obviously they hadn't cracked the factory ECU a year ago. And to be honest, they did nothing. They were snake oil. And let's face it, if you're splicing into the wiring to intercept the signals from the airflow meter and stuff to the ECU, there's only so much control you have. But some people have got them to work and, you know, Hats off to them, but us personally, we have steered clear of that sort of tuning with the GR Yaris. The next stage of development with the Yaris is still a stock turbo, but now with an aftermarket or programmable ECU. Now, at the time when we got started on the car, there was no options whatsoever. The ECU hadn't been cracked and no aftermarket options. But we worked with Powertune and Motec to develop a plug-in Motec package for the GR Yaris. And I will say this. It's unreal. Factory drivability, but yet the ability to tune and control anything you want. And it has been perfect the entire time that we've had it. Now, we all know how good Motec is if you're into cars. Does it mean there aren't other good solutions to use in the car? No, there are still plenty of other good ECU manufacturers. But the thing is with the Yaris, it has direct injection. So there are only a certain amount of ECUs that can control direct injection, Motec being one of them. Would we retune the factory ECU at this point? My personal opinion, and Ryan's going to go into more detail later in the video, is that reflashing of the factory ECU is still a very immature product right now. Um, if I worked with the right person to develop that, I would do it with some basic mods. But once you get more serious and want to squeeze the boost up, personally, I would go with the Motec package on the GR Yaris. Now, here's the thing. When we put the stock turbo with the Motec and the full exhaust system, we picked up 50 horsepower. That's right, 50 horsepower. In fact, it was slightly more than that with just the Motec and full exhaust, which I thought was unreal. So ECU, as you can see straight away, big, big power increase. Drivability is improved. The power curve, the torque, everything is better about the car once we put the Motec in it, plus the extra 50 horsepower. We also tried an intake at that power level, and guess what? Still, no. There was no difference in power with an aftermarket intake. But I will admit, there were some pretty cool sounds that came out of the car, a little bit like this. So the first mechanical issue that you get with a GR Yaris once you start pushing power is valve springs. We had valve float already with just a aftermarket exhaust and the Motec ECU. Basically power fell over early uh, and you could feel like an artificial limiter at high RPM. So basically the moment you up the boost or tune the ECU in a Yaris, you need to upgrade the valve springs. And Kelford uh, basically have the best solution for that and actually had that done pretty early. We we're one of the first people to put that in. Now here's the thing, while you've got the valve springs out, you might as well change your camshafts. Kelford make drop-in camshafts for the GR Yaris. And I will say this, they are excellent. We have seen 30 to 40 horsepower gains with the camshafts even with the stock turbo or with the aftermarket turbo, yet it still retains all the factory drivability down low. In fact, we found we had better mid-range with the larger turbo with the Kelford camshafts in there. So my attitude is, if you're going to put valve springs in, you might as well order some Kelford camshafts and put them in while you're at it. So you're going to see about 20, 20 horsepower, let's say, with the factory turbo here. So valve springs, camshafts. Now the next thing to try here is the intercooler. To be honest, there's not a huge amount of power to be gained from an intercooler at this sort of level with the stock turbo, but what you do get is much more consistent temperatures across every run. We found the factory intercooler just got lots of heat soak, so you need to go to an aftermarket intercooler to get consistent power, especially when you're squeezing some pretty good boosts. At this point, yes, you do want to go to the intercooler. Next is 
E85. I think it's the nectar of the gods and is essential on every turbocharged vehicle on Earth. The end. I understand not everyone can get it, but I think E85 not only helps you make more power, but it makes you safer for the car. It runs cooler, uh, it's obviously way more resistant to detonation, and you just find that cars on E85 can make way more power and more reliably. So E85 to me is a big deal. Now, you do need to upgrade the port injectors on the GR Yaris to run E85, but with the standard turbo, you can probably go to like a 680cc injector and be perfectly fine, and the rest of the factory fuel system can stay intact. Factory pump, factory lines, factory everything. All you need to change is the injectors, and you end up with about another 20 horsepower from having E85 and injectors. So they get the tick. So all up, everything here, the ECU, exhaust, valve springs, camshafts, intercooler, E85 and injectors is going to give you an extra 100 horsepower over factory. Now if you have the base model GR Yaris with the open centre front and rear differentials, I do strongly advise at this point you really do need to put at least a rear LSD into the car just for traction out of the hole uh, and even at the track as well. You actually will start getting a lot of wheel spin at this power level if you don't upgrade. We use the Toyota uh, Rally rear LSD, same as the one that comes from factory. Uh, do you need a front LSD at this point? Yeah, it'd be nice, but not essential yet. But you do need an aftermarket clutch at this power level. We used one from Golby's Parts that was done by NPC in Queensland and it was more than capable of handling all of that power. So now it's time to step things up a notch and go to upgraded turbo territory with your GR Yaris or Corolla. You've got two options here, high flow or a turbo kit. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the high flow turbo on this particular engine because it has an integrated exhaust manifold and rear housing. So to try and port that out properly to be able to fit a bigger turbine wheel is going to be very difficult. You can put a bigger compressor on, but at the end of the day, it, it's only gonna make as much power as the turbine wheel is going to let flow through it. So a bigger compressor is gonna help it probably make more mid-range. Uh, it can make more boost and more flow in the mid-range of the car, but at the end of the day, it's still gonna choke up up top. You can expect 20, 30, maybe 40 horsepower extra with a high flow turbo over what you could with a standard turbo, but they're not significant gains and they are really, I guess, quite a strain on the car due to exhaust back pressure. So you go to a turbo kit. We use the Golby's Parts G25 550 turbo kit and eCanoe actually use the same kit but with the G25 660. So you already know that that turbo is enough to go well into the tens on a GR Yaris and make more power than some other components can handle. So I also like the Golby's turbo kit because it has absolutely everything. It fit up perfect and you can watch one of our old videos to see us install that turbo. Now here's the next, I guess, roadblock you encounter with the GR Yaris and that is the fuel system for two reasons. The injectors that you use here might not be big enough uh, for the power you want to make here. We had to go to like an 1100cc injector, same as these injectors, it's available from Golby's Parts as well. But the big problem we had here is you run out of fuel pump. Now here's the thing, as of right now, there is no replacement in-tank pump for the GR Yaris and it's a very, very complicated design inside all the plastic hangers and everything going on. So, we made a custom aftermarket surge tank that we mounted under the back of the car and we used some of the factory lines as well as some Raceworks lines with AN fittings to custom make our own fuel lines and then we installed a turbo smart fuel pressure regulator in the engine bay, still a returnless system uh, and a very important thing that we did is we actually removed the factory fuel line uh, that goes to a T-piece that splits to the port injection and to the direct injection because it's very, very small and we basically made all new fuel lines. So basically everything from the pump to the fuel rail or the direct injection high pressure pump receiver, basically all of that is brand new fuel lines and bigger than factory. And what that basically enabled us to do is make as much power as the turbo and engine would let us make. If you don't change the fuel pump, you are going to run out of fuel well, depending on the dyno, on our dyno at the hubs, call it 380 horsepower, thereabouts, you're going to be out of fuel pump. On someone else's dyno, it could be higher. Uh, you know, it could be 400, 420 in the UK or something like that. But at that sort of power, you are approaching the end of the factory fuel pump. So once you've now upgraded the fuel system, 
uh, and you've got the turbo kit on there. If you've watched our videos, you'll know that the car is capable of some pretty serious power. 470 horsepower we did, uh, then 480, and then all the way up to 511 horsepower with camshafts in it on 34 pound of boost. Mechanically, nothing broke on the car, but here's the next limiting factor with this engine, that is head sealing. Basically, it can't seal the head gasket uh, at that sort of power level. Why? Could be head studs, could be head gasket design, although looking at it, we think the head gasket design is actually fine from factory. Um, and also, being an open deck block, it's probably starting to move around a little bit. So, if you want to know what the exact power level is, well, we think you're in danger territory on our hub dyno that we use at Powertune from about 420, 430 horsepower. When you start getting to 460, 470, you know it's definitely gonna happen at some point. And once you get 500, it is not going to last long at all. In fact, if anything, 500 horsepower is almost guaranteed uh, lifting of the head very, very quickly, if not even on the second or third dyno run. So the head is the limiting factor. Now, when we did the car, there was no aftermarket head studs or anything available, but right now, Golby's Parts have developed head studs and main studs for the GR Yaris, uh, which is gonna be pretty important to make the head seal. And we do know a couple of companies that are now working on an insert into the deck of the block to make it a closed deck block, which should also help with head sealing in the future as well. Powertune Australia recently completed another GR Yaris that is essentially identical to our own build, except for a slightly smaller exhaust housing and running on premium unleaded petrol. The car made 300 kilowatts on 28 PSI on the same hub dyno and was able to do it on the stock fuel system with just larger injectors. So now that you're past 400 horsepower with an upgraded turbo and fuel system, but you've stayed below what we call the danger zone for head sealing, what else do you need for your GR Yaris? Well, the clutch that you need at this power level is probably going to need to be a little bit more than you needed on stock turbo, but we still used a single plate clutch with no issue. At this point, I would be looking at definitely having LSD's front and rear if you don't have the version of GR Yaris or Corolla that comes with LSD's from factory. But what about the gearbox? Well, Honestly, stock gearbox is fine. We did heaps of drag passes on the street, Cootamundra at the drag strip, uh, all the way down to a 10.8 second pass, and it was all done with the factory gearbox. Um, so it's obviously a very strong unit. We had no broken shafts, no nothing. The only issue you have with the four-wheel drive system in the Yaris is either on the dyno, or sometimes at the circuit, you can overheat the four-wheel drive, and it will go into front-wheel drive mode. And obviously, the more power you make, the easier that can tend to happen. There are gearbox upgrade options. PPG now has a gear set for the GR Yaris that we tested. Uh, it is a close ratio, I guess a rally style gear set, straight cut dog engagement makes for lightning sh uh, fast shifts, but it is super short, so it doesn't really suit a road car or one you want to drag, but if you're doing tarmac rally sprints or autocross and things like that, it would be awesome. There are some sequential gearbox upgrades available now from Europe. Uh, I haven't driven one yet, but will be very shortly. So there is some gearbox options, but to be honest, for the average modifier, the stock gearbox, if that can get you into the tens, pff, yeah, you don't need to worry about it for a little while. So as you can see, the GR Yaris and GR Corolla three-cylinder turbo G16 engine does not need a lot of mods to make some pretty serious power. So now let's go catch up with Ryan from Powertune and he can talk even more detail about various aspects of tuning the GR Yaris. So we've been working on the Yaris now for around about 12 months, or well, give or take, um, and over that 12 months we've learnt a great deal. So everything from what the engine's capable of at you know the, the start or the start of you know modification, all the way through to this one making around 380 at the at the hubs. So if we look at the car as a whole as a development platform, I mean this this car's shocked us on numerous occasions. I mean to turn up and make 150 kilowatts and at the end of the development make 380. 80 is you know, mind-blowing really for the amount of work that's actually gone in in terms of mechanical modifications to the engine. There was countless steps. I mean, we, we went stock turbo, we pushed the stock turbo as far as it would go. It went way further than we you know, ever thought it would. We then changed over to E85. We were able to push the E85 you know, further than we thought it would go. Then we put the big turbo on and we went past 300 kilowatts and it was like, okay, is this going to stop? And then, I mean, we went 350 and then finally 380 and we've only now stopped because we've drawn a line in the sand. 
we haven't stopped because this is you know the mechanical limitation of this car yet i mean we've we've found that yes it needs head studs and a gasket at the point that we're at right now but we haven't you know we haven't broken this engine we haven't split the bore we haven't blown a piston out of it we haven't snapped a rod we're at the point now that if we put a head gasket in it and we put studs in it could we make 400 i don't know i mean the, to me I, I would like to think we could probably get there so because this is a, the, the development of a new car, it's not just like we have some information where we know where to do different things or what the engine likes or what the engine doesn't like. This has been a ground up development on a brand new car. So that means that we need to build an efficiency map. We need to learn where and when the camshafts want to, be, want to come in, want to move out. Um, we need to learn the full drive system, how it works, why it doesn't work, how to improve it. And all those things that we've shown in previous videos that we've done as sort of stages as, as we've done this build. So one of the other things that's sort of different about this car is the fact that it's direct end port injected. Now from factory, these cars have a very small port injector that's typically used at idle and to clean the back of the valves. And that's pretty much all it's, it's really used for. Now, some of the cars that you see you know, out and about with that dual injection of both direct end port injection, they actually supplement the fuel requ requirements by using the port injectors up the top. In the Yaris, this isn't the case. They're pretty much just used to clean the valves. So once we actually start to modify it and actually make more power, we start to use those port injectors to supplement the additional fuel that we actually require when we start to make more power. Yeah, so everything that we do um, when it comes to the fuel system in this car in terms of how the fuel is actually delivered is to optimize the power at different stages. So we can actually use the direct injectors down low where they really work quite nice on transient fueling and things like that. Um, due to them being direct injectors, high pressure, very well atomized fuel, it burns a lot better. And so down low, that's where those injectors really, you know, they shine. Whereas up top, when it's just bulk power that we're after and effectively just bulk fuel, then we can use the port injectors, which typically obviously have a lower pressure behind them and a, a, you know, not quite as good spray pattern. So the whole tuning process for this car is quite in depth and we've spent a lot of time on it. It's not something that I would expect that you know, someone new to, the, to direct injection tuning could just jump into this car and make the exact same power that we've made. Now, it's something that it will take you a lot of time to sort of optimize different parts of the car and, and sort of, you know, you sort of to and fro where you optimize one section, then you come back and you optimize another because it may you know, differ based on what you've done to some other system within the car. So that's something that we've spent a lot of time on and that's why we're able to achieve what we have um, things like you know crossing over between direct injection and port injection when to do that um, you know what effect does that have with the camshaft timing you know if we change our camshaft timing do we should we change that fueling over as well where, where it actually crosses over to the other injectors that's all something that at the end of the day the base file is very good and it's a very good platform now for everybody to build from so it's actually got a lot of good settings in there and it will it will do 95% of what you need, but if you're trying to extract the, the you know, the, the 10 tenths out of it, it's going to take some time to, to just spend, you know, learning the systems in the car. So the good thing about all this development work that we've, that you've seen, you know, in past videos and stuff on this car, that's all gone into the base map. That's all, you know, feedback that's, that's basically gone into what is actually now offered as off the shelf to Yaris, Motec Yaris customers. So one of the other things with this car that, we've, that we come across that sort of provided or, or caused us a little bit of a headache, um, it was the four-wheel drive system in the car. Now, you may remember from some of the early videos, we talk about the four-wheel drive system in the Yaris and how it actually works and what it's done on a chassis dyno or what you know, we typically see when a, a Yaris goes on a chassis dyno. Now, that to sort of recap, basically what happens is the, the four-wheel drive system in the car does not like the fact that it's trying to be locked up front to rear axle. And you'll typically see the four-wheel drive system unlock, drive all the drive to the front axle, and you'll see a hump in the end of your power curve, typically above five grand, and it basically will give you a false re you know, result on your dyno graph. Now, because of that, we had to look at you know, other ways to dyno the car to get around that system. Now, one of those ways is you can, you can remove the factory control, connect it to the MoTeC, you can control the four-wheel drive system and completely lock it up, absolutely. Is that the best way to do it? No, not really. Reason being is that when it comes to extracting 10 tenths from a tune, a chassis dyno is not really the best dyno to use for that application. The reason being is that we have our things like tire heat, we have strapping, we have variances in everything. And typically you can see two identical runs back to back, they may be 10 kilowatts different in power. 
purely because of the temperature of the tire, the way that it was loaded, all those types of things. So what we actually did, we moved the car onto a two-wheel drive hub dyno, which allowed us to make our results repeatable. What that meant is that we were able to do 10 back-to-back -back runs all within 0.5 of a kilowatt. So that sort of proves exactly how repeatable the result is when you put it onto a hub dyno, and that's why we use that system. It's not to try and make some huge amount of difference in power and stuff like that. It is literally for when it comes to tuning, we can put one degree of timing in and we can see what that actually does. So one of the other things as well is ignition timing in this car. What we found was that you know there isn't a huge gain to be had from ignition timing like in some other cars. Um, the timing's typically already pretty close to being optimized and power can actually be gained elsewhere. So that's through things such as camshaft timing, fuel timing, and you know boost fuel mixtures and things like that. So what you'll actually also find is that with a direct injection engine, the fuel mixture plays a big part in the amount of power that the car makes at a given point in time. Um, because the fuel is in the cylinder for less time, it means that there's less chance of that fuel pre-igniting, which typically means that you can run a, a leaner mixture because you're not trying to cool the cylinder as much with that additional fuel. Talking about breakages and mechanical limitations on the Yaris, that brings me to the next part of the conversation. Now, everybody would have seen that we lifted the head on this particular car. It's no, no, it's no secret, we've been open about that. There's a number of other Yaris's around that have had done the exact same thing. They may not tell you that, but they have, we know that for a fact. Being a global MoTeC dealer where, you know, we talk to people all around the world all the time, and we sort of, we've helped a lot of different shops around the world develop their Yaris's or assist them with tuning. And we stay in contact with a lot of people around the world in the Yaris community. We've been able to find out that there have actually been quite a lot of breakages with these engines. They are very fragile when it comes to you know, knock or detonation. Um, we've seen numerous engines now where the pistons have effectively disintegrated from knock. Now, it doesn't take much to get to that point. Typically, we're seeing that on 98 fuel. If you start to go pretty sort of heavy handed with your ignition timing and, and sort of run it on the knife edge, you run into this sort of area where the piston's at its kind of, at, at its limit, and a couple of knock events will shatter the piston. It effectively shatters like safety glass. Um, so we've seen that happen. Um, we know of other engines that have, you know, cracked bores and other things like that, but this is at much less power than what we've achieved. And it's typically through maybe not understanding the motor, maybe pushing too hard too soon, or doing it on bad fuel that you can encounter these things. So, it's not like this engine is absolutely bulletproof. I can tell you numerous stories of breakages. Um, this one genuinely, like no word of a lie, the only problem that we've had is lifting the head in this one. So we've done pretty well to get to that point. So some of the key things that to take away from you know, what we're talking about here with breakages is that in this particular example, we used E85 as our fuel of choice. The main reason is the knock resistance that that gives us and additional cylinder cooling as well. And then on top of that also, we, you may have, may have seen our previous videos where we talk about a torque limit. We come up with a torque limit based on what we sort of, we believed things would you know, survive at and we proved it you know, multiple times over where we actually tuned to a torque limit. What that means is that in the mid range, we didn't just let you know, the turbo make 35 pound and, and make as much torque as it wanted and then you know, we make peak power. We actually limited things through the mid range to maintain a very, very flat torque curve. The reason being is that that torque number if we increase that in the mid range, we believe that that's what's actually going to start breaking components. So that's one of the, or two of the key differences that we've actually got with this particular car that we believe's made it last this long. So in summary, this engine, if tuned correctly and really looked after in the, in the tune department, it's super, super, super impressive. There's, there's no, nothing else we can say. It is honestly super impressive. But like any performance engine, if you don't, you know, if you don't abide by these rules, it will break, There's, it's, it's the same as any other car. So the first step that I would take in order to sort of make more power than what we have, or at least make this power more sort of reliable to, to sort of beat on it a bit more, the clamping has to be sorted. So that's head studs and gasket, we've talked about that. The second step for me personally would be to basically put in some support around the top of the bores. Because at the moment, the engine's technically an open deck block which means that we've got a nice big thick cylinder wall, but there's no support for that wall. It's effectively freestanding inside the, inside the block. 
if we could potentially, say, have a 10, 10, 15 mil insert in the top of that block that holds the top of the bore, that would provide more support and stop the sort of the top of the bore bowing out. Um, that would be probably my next you know, recommendation for this engine. But beyond that, we don't know. I mean, are the pistons going to take more? At the moment, they haven't broken. Like I said, the weakness of the pistons is, is knock. And if you keep away from that, they, they seem fine. The rods, they seem quite good. The crank, again, no problems yet. So until someone really starts to push one of these cars and actually starts to, to sort of push the limits, we, we won't know what's actually next. One of the other things that I do want to touch on is that now the flash tuning of the factory ECU is becoming sort of available. Is this a good option? Yeah, look, I mean, for a power, power level of maybe up to 200, 250 kilowatts, I would say, yeah, look, it's, it's not a bad cost versus reward situation. However, if you're trying to make power like we are, there is absolutely no sense in trying to do the factory ECU. The factory ECU has lots of learning things in there that haven't been worked out yet. There's lots of parts of that flashing game that's still very much unknown. People are editing tables that they believe are something they may not actually be that. When it comes to control, you really, really need to use a system that you know is going to work, that has proper control over everything. So when I put in into the ECU, I want 12 degrees of ignition timing at this point, I need to get 12 degrees of ignition timing, not because of something else and something else, all of a sudden I get 14 degrees, because that's how we break these engines. So it's really important to have good control. And in this particular example, that's why we've gone with the MoTeC and it's proven itself time and time again to be the ECU of choice when we're really starting to push these cars. When it comes to factory ECUs, there are so many tables in these ECUs that we don't fully understand. So the process to actually flash a factory ECU is that someone has to disassemble the factory ECU code. This is not something that's simple. It's not something that's, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And a lot of the time, there's a, uh, an element of, I think this is something that looks like something and that becomes the table that becomes available to the tuner. Now, take for instance ignition timing. We see a table, it looks like an ignition timing table, we alter that and, and the timing changes. So we think it's the ignition timing table. However, behind that timing table, there might be another 18 additional tables that haven't been reverse engineered yet that alter that timing. So all of a sudden, when I command 12 degrees, it might give me 12 degrees on the dyno, but the customer goes out on the street, meets a certain set of circumstances where the car changes the timing table over to something different, and we have a, a catastrophic failure because all of a sudden I've now got four degrees more timing than what I wanted, and I've now got you know, a whole heap of extra boost, and now I have a hole in my block. So when it comes to the ignition timing table, to sort of extrapolate even further on this and sort of break down some of these timing tables, you might have a separate table for catalytic converter heating. So if the catalytic converter is in heating mode, it uses a different table. If the inlet air temperature is above a certain amount, it uses a different table. If you know, there's a torque limitation being put in place from either the all-wheel drive ECU, the ABS ECU, or some other part of the platform ECU, the, you know, that goes to a different table. If there's, you know, there's compensation tables that hang off those as well, based on what we would refer to as like a normalized load. So how long you've been thrashing the car for. So if you beat on the car for longer and longer and longer repetitively, the ECU will adapt to that and start to actually pull things back a little bit just to save itself. There's, there's you know, all these tables that exist in the factory ECU that haven't been defined, and I can't stress that enough. They exist in there, People think they've got the ignition timing tables and they, their tune may work on the dyno. But when it goes to really starting to stretch these cars and needing specifics and, exa and we're talking in exacts, it's not the right application currently. So the real key to that is the fact that with the MoTeC, yes, it has those tables as well, but we're in control of them. We have them defined, we have them set up, and we know that they're there. Whereas with the factory one, like I mentioned, they're in the ECU, but they may not be available to tuners yet. So because of all those connected systems, if you change things like cam timing, it may change your ignition timing, and it might change your, your, your lambda aim tables. It, there's, there's all this connection that goes on inside these ECUs that hasn't been completely figured out yet. So it's still very much in its infancy, and for someone that maybe wants just a little bit more power and they're running on you know, not many modifications, yeah, sure, at the moment it's, it's cost versus you know, real, you know, bang for buck, cost versus reward, 
it's not a bad solution. But if you're really starting to push these cars, you want to track them and you actually want to try and make some, some serious grunt out of them, I can't stress enough, you have to have control. And at the moment, Motec's the answer for that. So if you're wondering and you're saying, hey, well, give me proof that Motec's the best, all of the 10 second Yaris's all run Motec. The fastest ones around the circuit, Motec. Every single Yaris that's actually holding one of these you know, records, so to speak, has a Motec in it. We haven't seen one yet on a stock ECU make this sort of power or these sorts of results. It speaks for itself.